Okay. All right, everybody. So let's dive in. So let's talk about how Uber trips even happen before we get into the nitty gritty of how we save them from the clutches of a data center failover. Um, so you might have heard we're all about connecting riders and drivers. This is what it looks like. You've probably at least seen the rider app. You get it out, you can see some cars on the map, you pick where you want to get a pickup location. At the same time, all these guys that you're seeing on the map, uh, they have a phone open somewhere, they're logged in waiting for a dispatch. Uh, they're all pinging into the same data center here for the city that you both are in. So then what happens is you put that pin somewhere, you get ready to pick up your trip, uh, you get ready to request, uh, you hit request and that guy's phone starts beeping. Uh, hopefully if everything works out, he'll accept that trip. Uh, all these things that we're talking about here, the request of a trip, the offering it to a driver, him accepting it, that's something we call a state change transition. From the moment that you start requesting the trip, we cr start creating your trip data in the backend data center. And that transaction that might live for anything like 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, however many minutes it takes you to take your trip, we have to consistently handle that trip to get it all the way through to completion to get you where you're going happily. So every time this state change happens, um, things happen in the world. So next up, he goes ahead and shows up to you. He arrives, you get in the car, he begins the trip. Everything's going fine. Um, so this is, uh, this is of course, so some of these state changes are more or less important to everything that's going on. The begin trip and the end trip are the real important ones, of course, the ones that we don't want to lose the most. Uh, but all these are really important to keep on to. So, but what happens in the sense of failure is your trip is gone. You're both back to, oh my god, where'd my trip go? There you're, there you're just seeing the empty cars again, and he's back into an open thing, like where you were when you started opening the application in the first place. So this is, this is what used to happen for us um, not too long ago. So how do we fix this? How do, you, how do you fix this in general? So classically, you might try and say, well, let's take all the data in that one data center and copy it, replicate it to a back-end data center. Uh, this is a pretty well understood classic way to solve this problem. Uh, you control the active data center and the backup data center, so it's pretty easy to reason about. People feel comfortable with this scheme. It can work more or less well depending on what database you're using. Uh, but there's some drawbacks. It gets kind of complicated beyond two data centers. It's always going to be subject to replication lag because the data centers are separated by this thing called the internet or maybe leased lines if you get really uh, into it. Um, and so it requires a constant level of high bandwidth, especially if you're not using a database well suited to replication, or if you haven't really tuned your business model uh, to get the deltas really good. So we chose not to go this route. We instead said, what if we could solve it to back down to the driver phone? Because since we're already in constant communication with these driver phones, what if we could just save the data there to the driver phone? Uh, then he could fail over to any data center rather than having to control, well, here's the backup data center for this city, the backup data center for this city, and then, oh, no, no, what if in a failover we failed the wrong phones to the wrong data center and now we lose all their trips again? That, that would not be cool. Uh, so we really decided to go with this um, mobile implementation approach of saving the, the trips to the driver phone. Uh, but of course, it doesn't come without a trade-off. The trade-off here being you've got to implement some kind of a replication protocol in the driver phone consistently between whatever platforms you support, in our case, iOS and Android. So let's see. But if it could, how would this work? So all these state transitions are happening when the phones communicate with our data center. So if in response to his request, to begin trip or arrive or accept or any of this, if we could send some data back down to his phone and have him keep a hold of it, uh, then in the case of a, a data center failover, when his phone pings into the new data center, we could request that data right back off of his phone and get you guys right back on your trip with maybe only a minimal blip in the worst case. So at a high level, that's the idea, uh, but there are some challenges, of course, in implementing that. Not all the trip information uh, that we don't want to save is something we want the driver to have access to. Like To be able to get your trip and end it consistently in the other data center, we'd have to have the full rider information. Uh, if you're fair splitting with some friends, it would need to be all the rider information. 
So there's a lot of things that we need to save here to save your trip that we don't want to expose to the driver. Um, also, you have to pretty much assume that driver phones are more or less trustable, either because people are doing nefarious things with them, or people not the drivers have compromised them, or somebody else between you and the driver. Who knows? So for most of these reasons, we decided we had to go with a crypto approach and encrypt all the data that we install on the phones to prevent against tampering and leak of any kind of PII. Um, and also towards all these security designs and also simple reliability of interacting with these phones, you want to keep the replication protocol as simple as possible to make it easy to reason about, easy to debug, remove failure cases. And you also want to minimize the extra bandwidth. I kind of glossed over the bandwidth impacts when I said, you know, back-end replication isn't really an option. But at least here, when you're designing this replication protocol at the application layer, you can be much more in tune with what data you are serializing and what you're deltifying or not, and really mind your bandwidth impact. Especially since it's going over a mobile network, this becomes really salient. So how do you keep it simple? In our case, we decided to go with a very simple key value store so with all your typical operations, get, set, delete, and list all the keys, please. Uh, with one caveat being that you can only set a key once so that you can't accidentally like overwrite a key and it eliminates a whole class of weird programming errors or out of order message delivery errors that you might have in such a system. Um, and this did, however, then force us to move uh, what we call versioning into the key space, though. Like, you can't just say, oh, I've got a key for this trip, and please update it to the new version on each stage change. You know, instead, you have to have a key for trip and version, and you have to do this, set a new one, delete the old one, and that at least gives you the nice property that if that fails partway through between the set and the delete, you fail into having two things stored rather than no things stored. Um, so there are some nice properties to keeping a nice, simple key value protocol here. And then it makes failover resolution really easy because it's simply a matter of what keys do you have, what trips do you store, what keys do I have in the back-end data center, compare those, and come to a resolution between those set of trips. So that's a quick overview of how we built this system. Uh, my colleague here, Nikun Jagarwal, is going to give you a rundown of some more details of how we really got the reliability of this system to work at scale. All right. Uh, hi, I'm Nikunj. Uh, so we talked about the idea uh, and the motivation behind the idea. Uh, now let's dive into how did we design such a solution and what kind of trade-offs did we have to make while we were doing the design. Uh, so first thing we wanted to ensure uh, was that the system uh, we built is non-blocking, uh, but still provide eventual consistency. Uh, so basically, applications, uh, any backend application using the system should be able to make forward progress even when the system is down. Uh, so the only trade-off uh, the application should, uh, should be making is that it may take some time for the data to actually be stored on the phone. However, uh, using this application should not affect any normal business operations for them. Uh, secondly, uh, we wanted to uh, have an ability to move between data centers uh, without worrying about uh, data already there. Uh, so when we, when we fail over uh, from one data center to another, uh, we, uh, that, data, uh, that data center still has states in them, uh, and it still has its view of active drivers and trips. And uh, no service in that data center uh, is aware that a failure actually happened. Uh, so uh, at some later time, if we fail back uh, to the same data center, uh, then uh, its view of the drivers and trips may be actually different than uh, what the drivers actually have. And if we trusted that data center, uh, then the drivers may get on a stale trip, uh, which is a really bad experience. Uh, so we need some way to reconcile that data between the drivers and the server. Uh, finally, uh, we want to be able to measure uh, the success of the system all the time. Uh, so this system is only fully executed uh, during a failure. Uh, and a data center failure is a pretty rare occurrence. And we don't want to be in a situation where uh, we detect issues with the system when we need it the most. Uh, and uh, so what we want is an ability to constantly be able to measure uh, the success of the system so that we are confident in it uh, when a failure actually happened. Uh, so in uh, keeping all these issues in mind, uh, this is a very high level uh, view of the system. Uh, I'm not going, going to go into details of any of the services. Uh, but since it's a mobile conference. Uh, so the first thing which happens is that driver makes an update uh, 
or as Josh called it, a state change on his app. Uh, for example, he may pick up a passenger. Uh, now, uh, that update comes as a request uh, to the dispatching service. Uh, now, the dispatching service, uh, depending on the type of request, um, it updates the trip model uh, for that trip. And then uh, it sends the update uh, to the replication service. Uh, now, the replication service uh, will enqueue that request in its own data store and immediately return uh, a successful response to the dispatching service. Uh, and then finally, the dispatching service will update its own data store and then return a success to mobile. Uh, it may also return some other data to mobile. For example, uh, things might have changed since the last time mobile pinged in. For example, uh, if, you, if it's a, a, a Uber pool trip, then uh, the driver may have to uh, pick up another passenger. Or if the rider entered some destination, uh, we might have to tell the uh, driver about that. Uh, and in the background, uh, the replication service uh, encrypts that data, uh, obviously, since we don't want uh, drivers to have access to all that, uh, and then sends it to a messaging service. Uh, so messaging service uh, is something which we built as part of the system. Uh, it maintains a bi-directional uh, communication channel uh, with all drivers uh, on the Uber platform. Uh, and this uh, communication channel uh, is actually separate from the original request response channel, which we've been traditionally uh, using at Uber uh, for drivers to communicate with the server. So this way, uh, we are not affecting any normal business operation uh, due to this service. Uh, so the messaging service then sends the uh, message uh, to the phone uh, and get an acknowledgment from them. So. Uh, from this design, uh, what, we, what we have achieved uh, is that uh, we've isolated uh, the applications uh, from any uh, replication latencies uh, or, fail, uh, or failures uh, because our replication service returns immediately. And uh, uh, the only uh, extra thing the application is doing by opting in to this replication strategy uh, is making an extra service call to the replication service, uh, which is uh, going to be pretty cheap since it's within the same data center and uh, not traveling through internet. Uh, secondly, uh, now having uh, this uh, separate channel uh, gives us the ability to arbitrarily uh, query the state of the phone uh, without affecting any normal business operations. And we can uh, use that phone as a basic key value store now. Uh, next. OK. So, now, uh, now comes the issue of moving between data centers. Uh, so I said, as I said earlier, when we fail over, we are actually leaving states behind in that data center. So how to deal with stale states? Uh, so the first uh, approach we tried was actually do some manual cleanup. Uh, so we wrote some cleanup scripts. And every time you fail over from our primary data center to a backup data center, uh, somebody uh, would run that script in our primary. And it will uh, go to the data stores uh, for the dispatching service. And it will clean out all the states there. However, uh, this approach had operational pain because somebody had to run it. Uh, moreover, uh, we, we allowed the uh, ability to fail over uh, per city. Uh, so you can actually choose to fail over a specific set of cities instead of the whole world. And in those cases, this uh, script started be becoming complicated. Uh, so then we decided to tweak our design a little bit uh, so that we solve, uh, solve this problem. Uh, so the first thing we did was, uh, so as Josh mentioned earlier, uh, the key which is stored uh, on the phone contains uh, the trip identifier and the version uh, within it. Uh, so the version used to be uh, an incrementing number uh, so that we can keep track of any forward progress you're making. Uh, however, uh, we changed that uh, to a modified vector clock. Uh, so using that vector clock, we can now compare uh, data on the phone and data on the server. Uh, and if there is a mismatch, uh, we can detect any causality violations uh, using that. And uh, we can also resolve that using a very basic conflict resolution strategy. Uh, so this way, we handle uh, any issues with ongoing trips. Uh, now, next came the issue of uh, completed trips. Uh, so traditionally, what we've been doing is uh, when a trip is completed, uh, we will delete all that data about the trip uh, from the phone. Uh, we did that because we didn't want the uh, replication data uh, on the phone to grow unbounded. And once a trip is completed, it's probably no longer required for restoration. Uh, however, uh, that has a side effect that uh, mobile has no idea now that this trip ever happened. Uh, so what will happen is uh, if we fail back uh, to a data center with some stale data about this trip, then you might actually end up putting the ri uh, driver on that same trip, uh, which is a pretty bad experience because he's suddenly now driving somebody he, which he already dropped off, and he's probably not going to be paid for that. Uh, 
So what we did to fix that was, uh, so on trip completion, uh, we would uh, store a special key uh, on the phone. And the version uh, within that key uh, has a flag in it. Uh, that's why I call it a modified uh, vector clock. Uh, so it has a flag which says uh, that this trip has already been completed. Uh, and we store that on the phone. Uh, now, uh, when the replication service uh, sees that this uh, driver has this flag for the trip, then can tell the dispatching service that, hey, this trip has already been completed. Uh, you should probably delete it. Uh, so that way, uh, we handle uh, completed trips. Uh, so uh, if you think about it, uh, storing trip data uh, is kind of expensive because we have this huge uh, encrypted blob uh, of, uh, of, of JSON, maybe. Uh, and, but uh, we can store uh, the completed trips, a lot of, lot of completed trips, because uh, there's no data associated with them. So we can probably uh, store wor weeks' worth of completed trips uh, in the same amount of, uh, same amount of mem memory as we would store one trip data. So that's how we solve uh, stale states. Okay. So now, uh, next comes the issue of uh, ensuring four nines for reliability. So we decided to exercise the system more often uh, than a data center failure, uh, because we, uh, we wanted to get confidence that the system actually works. Uh, so our first approach uh, was to uh, do manual failovers. Uh, so basically what happened was that a bunch of us uh, will gather in a room e uh, every Monday uh, and then pick a few cities and fail them over. Uh, and after we fail them over uh, to another data center, we'll see uh, for how many, uh, what, what was the success rate for the restoration? And if there were any failures, uh, then try to look at the logs and debug any issues there. Uh, however, there were several problems with this approach. First, it was very operationally painful. Uh, so we had to do this every week. And for, P uh, for a small fraction of trips, which did not get restored, uh, we will actually have to do fair adjustments for both the rider and the driver. Uh, secondly, it, it led to a very poor customer experience because for that, for that same fraction, they were suddenly bumped off trip and they, they got totally confused, like what happened to them? Uh, thirdly, uh, it, it, it had a low coverage uh, because we were um, covering only a few cities. However, uh, in the past, we've seen problems uh, which affected only a specific city, uh, maybe because there was a new feature rollout in the city uh, uh, which, which was not global yet. So this. This approach uh, does not help us catch those cases until it's too late. Uh, finally, we had no idea uh, whether the backup data center can handle the load. Um, so in our current architecture, uh, we have a primary data center which handles all the requests, and then backup data center, uh, which is waiting to handle all those requests in case the primary goes down. But how do we know that the backup data center can handle all those requests? So one way is uh, maybe you can provision the same number of boxes and same type of hardware in the backup data center. but uh, what if there's a configuration issue uh, in some of the services? You wouldn't never catch that. And even if they're exactly the same, uh, how do you know that the, each service in the back of data center can handle a sudden flood of requests, uh, which comes when there is a failure? So we needed, needed some way to uh, fix all these problems. So then uh, to, to understand how to get good confidence in the system and to measure it well, we looked at the key concepts uh, behind the system which we really wanted to work. Uh, so first thing was we wanted to ensure that uh, all mutations uh, which are done by the dispatching service are actually stored on the phone. Uh, so for example, a driver, uh, right after he picks up a passenger, he may lose connectivity. Uh, and so replication data may not be sent to that phone immediately, but we want to ensure that the data eventually makes that, makes it to the phone. Uh, secondly, we wanted to make sure that the stored data can actually be used for replication. Uh, for example, uh, there may be some encryption decryption issue with the data, and the data gets corrupted, and it's no longer uh, needed. So even if you're storing the data, we cannot use it. So there's no point. Uh, or uh, restoration actually involves uh, rehydrating uh, the states within the dispatching service using the data. So if the, even if the data is fine, if there is any problem during that reha uh, rehydration process, uh, some service uh, behaving really uh, we would still have no use for their data, and we will still lose the trip, even the, the, though the data is perfectly fine. Uh, finally, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we needed a way uh, to figure out whether the backup data center can handle the load. So uh, to monitor the health of the system better, uh, we wrote another service. And uh, every hour, uh, it will uh, get a list of all active uh, uh, drivers and trips 
from a dispatching service. And uh, for all those drivers, uh, it will use that messaging channel uh, to ask for their replication data. And once it has the replication data, uh, it will compare that data with the data which the application expects. And using, doing that, we get a lot of good metrics around like how much data has means, uh, what percentage of drivers have data successfully stored to them. And we can even uh, break down metrics by region or by any app version. So this really helped us drill into the problem. Uh, finally, uh, to handle the, uh, to know whether the stored data can be used for replication and whether the backup data center can handle the load, uh, what we do is uh, we use all the data which we got in the previous step and we send that uh, to our backup data center. Uh, and within the backup data center, we uh, perform what we call a shadow restoration. Uh, and uh, since there is no, uh, no, nobody else making any changes in that backup data center, uh, after the restoration is completed, we can just query the uh, dispatching service uh, in the backup data center and say, hey, how many active riders and, uh, drivers and trips do you have? And we can compare that number with, our, uh, with the number we got in our snapshot from the primary data center. And using that, we get really valuable information around what's our success rate. And similar, we can do similar breakdowns by uh, different parameters like region or app version. Uh, finally, we also get metrics around uh, how well the backup data center did. Uh, so did we subject it to a lot of load or can it handle the traffic when there is a real failure? Uh, uh, also, like any configuration issue uh, in the backup data center uh, can, uh, can be easily caught by this approach. So using, these two, uh, using this service, we are constantly testing the system and making sure uh, we have confidence in it and we can use it during a failure. Because if there is no confidence in the system, then it's pointless. Uh, so. So yeah, uh, so that was the idea uh, behind the system and how we implemented it. Uh, I did not get a chance to uh, go into different components in detail, uh, but uh, if you guys have any questions, you can always reach out to us in the, uh, during the office hours. Uh, so thanks guys for coming and listening to us.